When I first decided to write their parallel lives, I may have been the only person anywhere to see a powerful connection between Ayan Hirsi Ali and Afia Siddiqui. Ayan was becoming famous, while on the other side of the world, Afia seemed little more than a face on a wanted poster. But each woman came to be seen under threat. They both took on an exaggerated political significance. In the West, people rallied around Ayan and the Enlightenment values that they felt she represented. Later, in Pakistan and elsewhere, Muslims mobilized around the figure of Afia and the Islamic purity she was felt to stand for. Flags were burned, governments fell, presidents and prime ministers were implored to save these idols. And the names, loved or hated, of these two previously unknown women rose to the lips of millions of people like the syllables of some powerful magic. They became icons on the war on terror. She's an innocent victim, the followers of each woman cried on talk shows and in the streets. She's a monster, the followers of the other muttered in return. From a distance, anyway, I came to see my enforced distance from both women as a blessing in disguise. The mythology surrounding both figures became increasingly obvious. And as I tried to sort the truth from a remarkable collection of lies, smoke, and mirrors, I grew more, more curious about how these two women got under other people's skin. Countless people followed their stories, breathlessly and furiously at times. They were like Rorschach tests. People saw utterly different things in them, and what they saw told you how they saw the war on terror. I came to believe that if I could crack the code of that dreamlike power, I might understand the deep structure of the defining conflict of our time.